Good evening. Hey, my name is Brent, and I'm a believer in Jesus Christ, and uh, I struggle with some things like codependent tendencies and wanting everybody to like me or approval kind of stuff and just uh, all kinds of things that, that are going on in my life that I'm thankful that Jesus is uh, helping me deal with. So uh, I'm pleased to be here with you guys tonight, and uh, let's pray first, and then we'll get started. Hey, God, will you just uh, enter this room tonight? Uh, will you let your Holy Spirit fill this place? Will you let this never be about me or, or anything that um, is remotely of, of human stuff? But would you let this all just be a message from you this evening? And uh, will you uh, just open our ears? Will you take the distractions out of the room tonight? Will you uh, just let us hear from you, God? And uh, will you teach us and will you help us to just grow in you and, and to know you even more? As we, uh, as we work through this tonight and as we leave this place tonight, will you just, uh, just fill us up with your spirit? It's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people say, amen. I had to, uh, had to go to the drugstore this morning and man, I was simply just trying to buy some toothpaste, but there are so many dang decisions. I mean, you got the whitening, you've got the total care, you've got all this kind of stuff. There's sensitive teeth. I don't even know if I have sensitive teeth, but man, the amount of decisions that we can make in a day, even just at the drugstore, simple stuff like that are just crazy. Uh, one of my buddies that I work with was telling me, he said, yeah, there's like 60 kinds of deodorant and I sweat through all of them by 9.30. So which one? It doesn't even matter what I choose, you know, but we're just filled with decisions. If you think about it, if you've had to go out to eat recently, if you've been uh, trying to choose a restaurant and you, you might have had this kind of conversation with some friends or family or something, it's like, where do you want to go? I don't know. Where do you want to go? I don't know. And nobody can make a decision. And it's like then someone finally does say, well, let's get Mexican. No, I had that last week, you know, or whatever. And decisions are kind of hard things to make. I work with students and they are uh, right now, a bunch of them are trying to choose a college and it's just tough stuff. One girl even said as she was sending off her, her essay uh, through email, through an electronic application process that they have, like, she wasn't real sure if she liked her essay or not, but her mom just pressed send and she's like, there goes my future. And she was all just torn up about it. You see, decisions can do that. They can kind of tear us up. And, you know, unless you're really lucky and have a codependent person in your life making all the decisions for you, which just makes life really easy and nice, not, then we all have to make a bunch of decisions. Now, one of the things that we have the privilege of knowing is that by the fact that we get to make decisions, that just shows us that God has given us some choice, right? God has given us a will to do with what we want. He could have made us into robots and could have just made us so that we had to follow him and do whatever. But nah, that's not how God chose to work his perfect love on the world. He decided to give us the opportunity to choose. And tonight, we're going to take a look at step three. Step three just simply says, we made a decision to turn our will and our life over to the care of God as we understood him. You see, we all have the opportunity to make a decision and we make a decision to turn our will over. You know, as we grow up, as we kind of start in life and we begin to, to become independent and we have the opportunity to make uh, some decisions, there's a power in choice, isn't there? When we have the opportunity to choose, you know, and, and what happens for a lot of us is that as we begin to have the power to choose, then we kind of set ourselves up our own little kingdom in the world of me. You know, everything begins to revolve around us. We anoint ourselves king of this little, little world that we've created, and we get to do whatever we want. You know, then life happens, though, and, and we begin to see that not everything's working out the way that we think it should. Not everything is, not everybody's acting the way that we want them to. And we just begin to realize that we aren't that powerful, you know, others don't always do the things that we want them to do. Situations don't always work out the way we want them to. And we keep trying to hold it together, man, with all of our power of choice and all the, all the decisions that we make. But man, pretty soon chaos just kind of comes into our world. It's everywhere. And when the chaos gets too tough, then we reach this point of this tough decision. And the tough decision is this, and every one of us has to make it at some point in our life. Am I gonna give the job of king to somebody who can really handle it? Or am I gonna squander my life by just trying to continue to be in charge? 
You see, that's, that's the point that we all come to. And, and we have a recovery saying that says, your best thinking got you here. You know, your best thinking has brought you to this place. And it was like, your best ability to be king, your best ability to be in charge, that's what brought you to this place, you know? And, and, and then we get to the point that it's, we realize that life was unmanageable and we realize that somebody had to be bigger and better and greater than us to be able to control it and to be able to help us out. And so that's where we're at when we get to step three. We're making that decision. We're using our power of choice to turn our will and our life over to the care of God. So we turn it over. We let go of the crown. We take it off our head and we say, you know what? Hey God, I want you to be in charge. Please just take the wheel of my life. I'm not gonna try to steer anymore. I'm not gonna try to direct my path, but I'm just gonna trust you. So we release the control of everything and we just release it over to God. Now, the interesting thing is that we're releasing this over to the care of God as we understand him is what the step says. As we understand God gets to be a tricky question sometimes because our view of God is shaped. I mean, it basically shapes our perception of what it means, how he cares for us. But our view of God a lot of times is shaped on lots of things in the world. In other words, we have relationships with human beings and we want to make sure and we want to think that all of the things that they're trying to um, portray for us, we want to put those on God. So if somebody's mean to us, then we may think they're, that God is mean. You know, and it gives us these little views of God. Like one of the views of God is that, that God is a punisher. Like, like he's sitting up in heaven, he's just got this evil out. <laughs> and he's waiting for us to just blow it or make a mistake so that he can, can ring up just on our tab, like all the wrong things that we do and keep us out of heaven. I mean, that's one of our, one of our thoughts of it. It's kind of like he's this, this little kid with a magnifying glass, only God's got the magnifying glass and we're the ants. You know how kids try to do that in the summertime? They'll take the magnifying glass and they'll put it in the sunlight and it just fries the ant. You know, they might be kind of sick if they're doing that, but lots of kids do that. That's our view of God when we think of him as a punisher. I mean, lots of people in our world think that God's only out there to destroy their fun, to keep them from having any good time at all. So we look at God as a punisher. Some of us in our world are looking at God as, as a hands-off God. Like he made this whole world, he made this terrestrial kind of merry-go-round and he turned it on and then he just walked away. Like he doesn't care at all, he's just gonna let it spin and spin and spin. And it's kind of a hands-off God. Like he doesn't want to have any kind of relationship with his creation. You see, there's lots of folks in our world that look at that. We, we call them theologically, we call them deists. That's, that's the deist view is that God created something in his hands off and he just used all his power to create it, but he doesn't want to be involved with his creation. Now, a biblical view of what God looks like is that God is father. But even when we look at the word father, then our relationships with our own dads come into play with that. If we had a dad who was abusive, or, or if we had a dad who was just cruel or took no interest in us, then we are probably gonna transfer that understanding of what we've experienced in our lifetime to God. And, and that can mess our image of, of what God really is, even when we're looking at him as father, because we can't get a real picture of just what God is really like. Now, scripture tells us that every one of us has a view of God. Paul's writing to the Romans and, he, and it's, it's just chapter one. He says that all of us have a knowledge of God, whether it's from creation and the way God made everything. I mean, we, we have beautiful, beautiful scenery to look at. We have rivers and water and we have nature and butterflies and flowers and all this kind of stuff. And, and lots of it has this intricate design and we can look at that and we know that there's gotta be something bigger than us. What Paul was telling the Romans, he says, no matter what, every person begins at some point to realize that there is something bigger and something greater than them. Now, the problem with that is that that can scare us away because that means if there's something greater than us, then we have to admit it. And we have to, in a sense, bow down to that. And we have to be accountable to this power that is so much greater than us. Blaise Pascal is a guy who, who had a really cool quote that says, I think that the whole idea of addiction or compulsion is the whole in the human soul. 
trying to find God, the God-shaped hole. You see, that's really what Paul was saying, right? Is that we all have this spot in us that needs relationship with God, that, that needs something bigger than us, something greater than us. And that's what steps one and two do. They say that, that as we realize that life is unmanageable and we, we find this higher power or this greater being or this thing that can help us manage that and control that. And then step three is saying, you know what, we're gonna turn the control over to God. That's what it's saying. And a lot of us, because of how we view the world and how we view God in the world, we're surprised to know that God just cares about us, that God would be patient with us and, and, and not, you know, we don't have to change to come to God. He wants us just the way we are. He wants us just the way we are. We don't have to go get everything all cleaned up and then all of a sudden come to God and he'll accept us. No, God accepts us just the way we are. That's the true view of what God is. The question for us tonight is, do we believe that God has our best interest at heart and our best interest in mind? Are we willing to trust him with that? Do we think that he can lead our life and control our life in a better way than we can do it for ourselves? You know, when we come to the idea of understanding God, um, a lot of us just don't think we can be real with God. There's a guy in the Bible named David. He, uh, he was called a man after God's own heart, and he wrote a lot of the Psalms. One of the things that, that David kind of teaches us is that we can just be honest with God. You know, we can be real with God. There was this old butter commercial that used to say, you can't fool mother nature. You know, well, that's, that's how a lot of our society views it. We can be real honest with God. Take a look at this Psalm. It's Psalm 88. And it says, O Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you day by day. I come to you at night. Now hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for my life is full of troubles and death draws near. I'm as good as dead, like a strong man with no strength left. I mean, here's a guy, David, who was able just to say, you know what, God, my life sucks right now. I mean, it just stinks. It's horrible. I mean, every relationship that I've got is blowing up. There are people that are trying to kill me. There's all kinds of things. David was able to just be real with God. And a lot of us are wondering, how do we get from this kind of place where we're at? Because our life is just blown up and it's out of control and there's nothing at all that we can do to change it. How do we get to that place, to then this place? And listen to this Psalm from David, it's Psalm 125. And it says, those who trust in the Lord are as secure as Mount Zion. They will not be defeated, but they will endure forever. Just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people both now and forever. Do you hear the difference? There's this guy, it's the same guy who writes both Psalms. And one of them, he's just basically crying out to God because everything is horrible. But then over here, he's saying, man, how awesome it is just to be loved by God because there's a security in God that I can't find in anything in this world. And the fact that God loves me just blows my mind is really what David's saying. You see, we have to know the second Psalm to be able to get through the first Psalm. We have to be, realize that, that God is good, that God does what he says he'll do, who, he is who he says he is, that his desire for us is, and his plans for us are plans that are gonna prosper us and give us a hope for the future is what Jeremiah says in 29, 11. But it's not a God that's trying to punish us or hurt us or do anything else, but God has our best interest at heart. See, what God really wants for us is God wants intimacy. See, God wants an intimate relationship. Now, we hear the word intimacy in our society, and, and a lot of times we want to take it to this, this place of sexuality or something like that. No, God just wants us to be in relationship with him and to know him for who he is, and he already knows us for who we are. We can't, we can't fool God. I mean, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing. But you see, what God wants in our lives is for us to be intimate with him and for him to be able to be everything that we need. You see, that's what a picture of intimacy looks like. 
Actually, it kind of looks like this. I don't know if you like to travel or not, but, but picture yourself getting ready to take a trip, right? And, and if you're in charge of the trip, you're gonna call AAA uh, or you're gonna you know, go online, you're gonna get on Expedia or one of those kind of places and you're gonna start to, tr- to put all the details together for your trip, right? You're gonna pick your place that you wanna go. You're gonna get your hotel. You're gonna get your airfare, your mega bus ticket, whatever it might be. You're gonna get it all and you're gonna get ready and you're gonna go on this trip. Now, just let's picture it a different way. Let's just say that, that God says to us, that Jesus is saying to us tonight, man, let's take a trip. Well, our first reaction to Jesus when we say, let's take a, when he says, let's take a trip to us, is this, well, well man, how long is this trip gonna take? Because, you know, I, I, I've got work to do and I've got some different stuff. How long is this gonna take? Or, or what's it gonna cost me? Because, you know, I just don't have that much in the savings account right now and I can't do that. Or, you know, I just really need to know where we're going because I got to know what the pack is. Is it summertime stuff? Is it wintertime stuff? I just don't know. See, most of us want to do that right away. And this picture of intimacy just looks like this. What Jesus is saying to us is saying, hey, let's take a trip. Let me lead you. Let me guide you. And you don't have to worry about anything. The expense is paid. The bags are packed. Everything that you need, everything that you've got to have for this trip, I'm gonna take care of it. I've got it all planned out. Will you go? You see, that's what intimacy looks like with Jesus because he's just saying, you know, I wanna lead your life for you. I know that you've tried. I know that you've been the king for a while. I know that it's blown up. But man, I wanna lead you in a way into a place that's gonna be so much better than what you've got now. That's what intimacy looks like. You see, as we understand God isn't about us getting to define God because if it was, that would just be idolatry. Lots of us want to make God into this thing, you know, we like God if he takes care of our little wish list and our little checklist and we pray certain things up and then he, he fills them out. But having a relationship with God and being in, in relationship with him and turning our will and our lives over to him and us understanding God's care for us is not about us getting to define God. You see, he takes us just as we are. We don't even have to try to define him or do anything. It, even if you don't believe in him tonight, he believes in you. It doesn't matter what shape you walked into this room. It doesn't matter what struggles you've had. It doesn't matter what hurts you're harboring, what grief you're carrying, what shame you got. He says, just bring it. Just bring it because you can lay it at my feet. You see, this is the step where it begins. We can never get to step step six, seven, 12. We can't get to any of those things without this step right here of turning it over. You see, we make the decision in our mind to put the action in our heart and we follow and we just give ourselves over and we let God have the wheel and we give God control. Now, there's an awesome scripture in Matthew. Matthew 11 says this, and this is the way Jesus says, he says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. See, recovery is why we're here tonight. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest, to walk with me and to work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. See, that's what this step is about. The step and the decision to turn our will over to the love and the care of God as we understand him is us understanding that God wants the best for us. No matter what our past is, he's got our future. And it's a future that we can count on as being awesome because that's what God wants for us. He wants us to have life and have it abundant. He knows the plans he has for us. You see, God's promises are just constantly, constantly telling us that he's got something better than if we're in charge on our own. And that's where we're at tonight is the place where we make the decision to just take the action, to turn it over to God. It's where the work begins. It's where the surrender begins. It's where the healing begins. 
And I have a feeling just if you're like me, we all need the healing that only can come from Christ. God loves us so much that he offered Christ up to go to the cross for us, to pay the debt for us because he wanted an intimate relationship with us. He wants to know us and wants us to know him. Are you ready to take the step tonight? Are you ready to make that decision and just give it all to Christ? Let's pray. Hey God, we, uh, we just thank you for who you are. We thank you that, uh, that you're not a punisher. We thank you that you're not a hands-off God, but that you want to be in relationship with us. So God, tonight, we just ask you to fill our hearts up. We want to surrender to you. We want to ask you to take the wheel. We want to take the crown off, and we want you to be in charge because we can't do it ourselves. God, will you continue to teach us and help us to know more of you and, 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 and see you as you really are? as this God who cares and loves. Even if, if the world around us doesn't show us that, God, will you just show us those things through your Holy Spirit that our lives might be changed and that healing might happen and that we might find recovery and that we might find rest in you. Amen.